Hey bud, welcome to Hey, How's That Work with Luca. That's me, I'm Luca. Today, we're talking about George Daniel's actual living, breathing, biological child. It's the coaxial movement. He tried to sell it to a whole lot of people. And they didn't want it, Rolex didn't want it, Panerai didn't want it, I don't know if they didn't want it, I don't know if Panerai was around. Omega did want it, and they got it. And they kept it, now it's theirs, now nobody can have it, but Omega, it's their baby. It's real cool, I'm gonna tell you about it in like 10 seconds now. I can't wait to see you there. So, the coaxial. Well, how's that work? To understand how the coaxial works and why it's special, first you need to understand how the Swiss lever works, and then you'll get more sense of the improvements and why they're important. If you want to get into the nitty gritty of how the Swiss lever escapement works, Nate actually did a great video on that that we'll post to link to down in the description. You can check that out. For now, we're really just gonna address the inefficiencies of the Swiss lever system. So, those inefficiencies, what are they? When we're talking about the inefficiencies of the Swiss lever system, we'll first focus on the interaction between the escape wheel and the pallet fork. You see, the escapement of any watch has two main functions, and that is to lock and unlock the gear train, and it's also to deliver and receive the impulses from the balance wheel to let that little bit of power escape for your watch to tick. So, the first thing comes up when the pallet stones lock with the escape wheel. And then when they're unlocking, the escape wheel will actually rub along what's called the impulse face of the pallet stone. Now the impulse face is slanted, so at the very end, when the teeth are about to come off of the pallet stone, it delivers a little push. Why is this important? Well, that rubbing motion between the teeth of the escape wheel and the impulse face of your pallet stone it's actually a, a great source of friction. There's a lot of sliding friction going on there, which as we said before, friction is the enemy of precision watchmaking and of precision timekeeping. That's one problem. Another problem arises from the travel distance and the force applied when the pallet fork swings back around to lock with the escape wheel. You see, there's actually that travel distance is so great and there's so much force that when the pallet stone comes back around and hits the escape wheel, the escape wheel will actually bounce off of it and then come back, and that is wasted motion. That's another no-no, you don't want wasted motion. So, how were these things addressed and fixed in the coaxial? See, that's what Daniels was trying to do. He was trying to take these inefficiencies and fix them, which results in a more robust, more precise movement, watch, all the above. So, the first thing that was done in order to mitigate these problems was the introduction of your coaxial wheel. It's actually two wheels stacked on top of each other, sharing an axis, hence coaxial, sharing the axis, stacked on top of each other. Why is this important? You see, instead of having your escape wheel control the locking, the unlocking, and the delivery and reception of impulse to the balance wheel and pallet fork and stuff, you have everything separated. As we discussed, the coaxial wheel consists of two wheels sharing an axis. Each wheel then interacts with a pair of pallet stones. Stones numbered 1 and 3 will lock and unlock the gear train, while stones 2 and 4 will deliver and receive impulses to and from the balance wheel. Now, one thing to notice is the teeth on your coaxial wheel are shaped differently than those of your Swiss lever escape wheel. They come to a point. This point then delivers the impulse to the side of the pallet stone in a pushing motion as opposed to the sliding motion of your Swiss lever. This change eliminates the sliding friction in the system. So, instead of you having to design around multiple functions, by designing each part to perform one function, you can eliminate the proverbial wiggle room and you get tighter tolerances, which tighter tolerances lead to better function, more precise timing, and an extended service interval, because you're not getting all that rubbing and slapping around. An interesting point of your coaxial is because of the tight tolerances, because of the limited surface area that's interacting, the lubrication in your escapement is for sound dampening. It's not actually entirely necessary for the function of the escapement. 
because there's so little friction. It works, it works so well that you don't need it. So to recap, we have the division of labor. We have your coaxial wheel. You have two corresponding pallet stones that are only involved in the locking and unlocking of the gear train. You have your two pallet stones that deliver and receive impulses to and from the balance wheel. And by specializing all of these parts, you then get tighter tolerances. Tighter tolerances lead to more accurate precision timekeeping. You also get less wear and tear. You get less sliding and rubbing between parts, which in turn leads to a longer service interval. Like I said, you get almost double a service interval between you having to send it in. All of these benefits allow the coaxial to become the foundation Omega built upon to achieve their master chronometer status. And to be fair, achieving the same feat with a Swiss lever escapement would be difficult, especially at the scale Omega does it at. I mean, if you think about it, this is one of the few, if not the only major advancements within watchmaking for, for 250 years. I mean, the Swiss lever escapement is, is really it. That's, that's what's been around. Now you got the coaxial. So that's it. That's how the coaxial works with Luca and Luca. <laughs>